Hello everybody, welcome to the first lecture video for Unit 5 on land and water use. Uh, in this unit, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, things that we've been mentioning all year, such as oceans and fishing, uh, forests and forestry, mining, uh, urban development, um, farming as well, soil. And we're going to be talking about all those things as, in, as, as resources, think about uh, how we can use them more sustainably, and what are the challenges that we're going to face in making the move towards sustainable resource use. So uh, when we talk about resources, we're talking about a variety of different things. Like I mentioned, uh, forests, oceans, uh, land and soil, everything from farming to livestock uh, to mining, cities, and even our waste disposal. Uh, fresh water, again, in terms of fishing, but also uh, the fresh water that we drink underground. The atmosphere, in terms of the air that we breathe and uh, the way that we pollute it as well as energy reserves such as fossil fuels like coal, gas, and oil, but also non-fossil fuels like um, nuclear and even things like wind and solar. So all these resources, how can we use them in a sustainable way? Well, in order to figure that out, we actually need to consider what does it mean to be sustainable. Uh, and sustainability, as David Attenborough put it nicely, is uh, being able to do what we do forever. Uh, uh, to use resources in a way that's not going to deplete them for future generations, right? It's really easy to be sustainable with renewable resources because they don't run out. But things like coal or soil, uh, we have to conserve them uh, carefully. And there are five uh, key environmental indicators to help us determine uh, whether or not we're being uh, sustainable with our resource use. The first of which is biodiversity. Um, and uh, it, in, in recent years, we're seeing a growing extinction rate um, as humans capitalize on the ecosystem services of various ecosystems, uh, and we're entering a sixth mass, exti mass extinction where uh, thousands of species are going extinct every year. Uh, there are a lot of solutions to preserving biodiversity, such as legislation, things we've already talked about, uh, like the Convention in, on International Trade for, for Endangered Species, as well as the Endangered Species Act, and also uh, legislation like the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, which helps preserve the um, cleanliness and, uh, of our air and water and reduce air and water pollution. Uh, we could eat less meat. That's going to have a variety of impacts. Uh, and one of which will be helping to preserve biodiversity. I'll talk about that uh, later on this unit. Uh, we want to buy products from, that are sourced from uh, sustainable companies, uh, looking at things like palm oil and soybeans, fish. Uh, where are we getting our products? Uh, are, they, are these companies using sustainable practices, or are their practices um, leading to more extinctions? Uh, and lastly, we can just enjoy nature, appreciate the biodiversity, um, spend our dollars on... Uh, th things like visiting national parks, etc., to show the economy and the country and the world that we value this. It's something that's worth protecting. Uh, that the, the power of your wallet cannot be understated. A second global indicator for sustainability is food production. Uh, we are deforesting a lot of land for agriculture, um, and we're finding that there's a food shortage. Um, and, and what I mean by that is not that there isn't enough food, but there's not enough access to food. 40% of all food in the United States is wasted, um, meaning that if you buy 10 apples at the store, uh, odds are, uh, on average, four of those are just going to get thrown directly in the trash and they're never going to get eaten. That's uh, in 2010, that was 133 billion pounds and $161 billion worth of food. Uh, and if you look at different counties within Connecticut, right? We can look at food security, right? This idea of access to food. The more food secure you are, uh, the, the more likely it is you have access to food that you don't have to think twice about where your next meal is coming from. Greenwich is green, meaning that we're at low risk uh, that a resident is food insecure, but you can see in many areas around Connecticut, there are uh, a lot of high-risk areas where a resident is likely going to be food insecure. Um, and if we break down Greenwich, Right, we've got a population of 62,000. About 8.8% 8 .8 of those people are food insecure, uh, with 6.3% of the population being uh, poverty. Right, you can see Greenwich is extremely wealthy. Right, the national uh, gross income is like $40,000. So this is really high with low unemployment, um, and we can start to see some issues arising with environmental justice and environmental racism as well. When we're seeing that the areas that are food insecure tend to be areas that are predominantly dominated by uh, communities of color. Um, that's something we'll get into uh, a little bit more when we talk more about farming and urban design. So what can we do to help um, uh, 
mitigate issues with food production. Uh, we can use genetically modified organisms to increase the hardiness of the crops we grow as well as to increase yields. We can do indoor gardens with hydroponics and vertical gardens. You can grow your own food and we want to focus on uh, eating locally food that is in season, empowering local uh, small farmers who are or are not operating on giant scales producing uh, uh, large amounts of waste and fossil fuel emissions, etc. The third indicator is the average global surface temperature as well as the carbon dioxide concentration. Um, both of these things are going to increase, at least in the short term, no matter what we do. Um, but there are a lot of solutions that can help turn these trends around, right? Uh, since the 1860s, you can see temperature has increased substantially. Um, and if we look at the uh, CO2 emission or CO2 uh, concentration in the atmosphere since 1960, this is, uh, we've looked at this graph before, we can see that it's increasing dramatically. So as we shift towards renewable energy, like solar, wind, and geothermal. We move towards electric cars. We eat less meat, and we're buying products from green companies. We're recycling, etc. Um, we're going to have uh, slow but steady progress towards reducing our CO2 output and, and subsequently reducing the temperature. Uh, the fourth indicator is human population. We spent a whole unit talking about this, so I won't spell, spend a lot of time on it. Our, our population is growing exponentially. Uh, over the past few years, but uh, now the growth rate is starting to decrease. So this is the population over the past few thousand years. It's skyrocketed in the last hundred, uh, whereas this is the population growth rate. And you can see it was very high in the 60s and 80s, and it's been dropping ever since. The where population growth is slowing. Um, solutions to mitigating our impact of our population is to uh, urbanize, um, so that way we're not using as much land and aid developing countries that are still going through demographic transition through education, family planning, and targeted financing backing um, to help them uh, uh, get through the demographic transition faster. Um, there's this quote from the office that uh, there's too many people in the world, we need a new plague. Uh, probably um, a lot of people think that's funny. Uh, and it is, although in, in 2020 with the coronavirus, it's not so funny anymore. Uh, this isn't the solution, right? Um, as, as we're seeing pan out in real time, because the population is going to level out at the carrying capacity of about 11 billion. Um, we need to, we can't think, be thinking about population control uh, so much as um, how can we sustainably support a population of 11 billion. And the last one is, is uh, the last indicator for sustainability is resource depletion. Whether it's coal or forests, um, there are a lot of resources that are being rapidly depleted. Thankfully, as we increase our technology, we can use them in new ways. We're more efficient at using them, and we're raising the carrying capacity of the earth. Um, we can't uh, rely on non-renewables like coal and oil indefinitely. It's just not going to happen. Uh, we only have about 40 to 50 years of oil left if we continue using it at this rate. So again, we need to shift towards renewable energy, decrease our dependence on uh, uh, fertilizer, and start reforesting areas. Uh, there's this idea when harvesting resources of the maximum sustainable yield, if we go back to our population growth rate with the logistic curve, this is the biotic potential, the fastest growth rate. So when we harvest a population, whether it's fish or trees or whatever, uh, we want to harvest, say, the population's at 100. We don't want to harvest it all the way down to zero, take every single tree out, because then the population's not going to be able to grow back, right? Uh, the maximum sustainable yield is... is uh, uh, harvesting the population down to the point where it's at the fastest growth rate, that biotic potential. If we go from 100 to 50, the population will grow back very quickly because the slope is very steep here. The growth rate is very rapid. So if we harvest down to this point, the population will bounce back very quickly. And it won't compromise the future availability of the resource, whether it's trees or fish or, or cows or whatever. Um, you can also think about it as the, the maximum harvest that you could take uh, that is replaceable by the population growth in a short period of time. Um, in theory, if we continue harvesting at this maximum sustainable yield, uh, we can use that resource indefinitely without ever depleting it. Uh, there are a lot of issues with this idea, though. First of all, uh, if you consider life history strategies and survivorship curves, um, it's not going to be the same for every species. Um, you also want to consider the births and deaths rates. How can we even calculate the carrying capacity of an ecosystem? Um, this idea of MSY can be rather uh, political sometimes, and it's almost impossible to calculate. It's going to be different in every scenario. So in theory, it's a great idea, right? It should maybe guide the way we view uh, our use of these resources, but um, it's hard to actually implement. And that's true for a lot of theories, in, especially in ecology and environmental science.
Um, but we can measure our resource demand, and we can do that by uh, using something called an ecological footprint, a term you've probably heard before. It's basically the human demand on nature, uh, and we use it to compare the resource demands and as well as the waste production required uh, to support either an individual or an entire population. Um, fancy definition is the amount of biologically productive land and water needed to supply people with the resources they need and to absorb their waste and their pollution produced by the resource use. So how much land do you need to support your lifestyle, to providing the resources you need and absorbing your waste? Um, and ecological footprints, um, they, they measure how fast we consume and how fast we generate waste, including things like energy, uh, land use for, for uh, habitation, timber and paper, food and fiber, seafood, etc. And how, how quickly can uh, our, our environment absorb the impact of our resource use. Um, and ecological footprints are often a me measure of area in hectares uh, because, it, remember, it's the amount of land required to support an individual. A hectare, by the way, is, is about almost one and a half times a soccer field. It's 10,000 square meters. So it's 100 by 100 meters, and it's about two and a half acres or, or, or um, a hundredth of a kilometer squared. Uh, so let's take a look at how much biologically productive space is actually available around the globe. Uh, discounting things like deserts, glaciers, and open ocean, about 11.3 billion hectares are available for uh, producing resources that we need, whether it's cropland, forests, fisheries, uh, you know, etc. Um, and there are uh, about uh, 8 billion people on the planet right now, more or less. Um, and so uh, if you do that some division, that's about, about 1.8 hectares available per person, per capita. Um, in America, the average, bio or the average um, ecological footprint is uh, 9.7 hectares per person. So you can see there's a massive discrepancy between the American lifestyle. We require almost 10 hectares per person for our lifestyle. Um, but in theory, if we do the math, we should really only be using about two hectares per person. So uh, America is, is experiencing something kind of like a, an overshoot, right? We've exceeded our carrying capacity. In the short term, we will survive, but in the long term, that's not sustainable. Um, so we are, we are actually in an ecological deficit. And much like when you're out of money, you're in a deficit. Uh, we are out of, uh, oh, my cat is walking across my computer, sorry. Um, when we are in an ecological deficit, our footprint is bigger than the capacity of the, of the environment to support us, right? We've, we've exceeded the carrying capacity. That's the idea, right? Um, so if we look at this graph, we've got time on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we've got the number of Earths required to sustain the population. So up until 1980 or so, we hadn't exceeded uh, about, you know, the need for having a, a one Earth to sustain the population. And by the time we reached 2010, our resource demands um, long term would, re would require one and a half Earths to sustain. If we don't make any changes by 2050, that's going to be close to three Earths. But if we do make some uh, rapid reductions, uh, we can get it down to a more sustainable use where we're not using more than the Earth can provide, where we're not exceeding biological capacity or carrying capacity. Basically the same thing. Um, and if we look at uh, ecological reserves versus deficits around the world, we see some patterns where uh, in red and orange are um, in a deficit, whereas green and yellow are in a reserve, meaning that they're, uh, green and yellow are using less than uh, the environment can provide, whereas red and orange are using more than the environment can provide. Right? We, we notice some interesting patterns uh, based on the types of countries that are red versus the types of countries that are green. Um, and if we look at the total footprint, the uh, total hectares required for different countries around the world, the United States requires about, um, this is in millions of hectares, uh, 2,810 million hectares uh, for the entire country. That's 25% uh, of the world. The EU requires 2,160 million, uh, million hectares, about 19%. China and, uh, has, is a little bit below that, and India and Japan have a significant drop-off from there. But this is for the whole population. What about if we look at it per capita, per person? Well, we see the pattern shift a little bit. The United States is still the biggest with almost 10 hectares per person. The EU is just below 5 hectares per person. China, 1.6. India, 0 0.8. Uh, so India actually has a pretty small ecological footprint. Japan skyrockets up, though. If we go back to this, they had the lowest of these five, and now they have uh, the second highest, right? So think about why that might be. 
Currently, the global average is about 2.2 hectares per person. And if we go back to the math I did earlier, we should really only be using 1.8 per person. So on the global average, we've already, we're already uh, at a biological deficit. Um, oh, fancy transition. I forgot about that. And if we look at the ecological footprint per capita around the world, again, we see interesting patterns of developed wealthier countries versus non-developed uh, 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 less wealthy countries, right? Countries like the United States, Canada, much of Europe and Australia and New Zealand, very wealthy countries, have high footprints per person. They have the luxury lifestyle right, that we talked about at the beginning of the year, whereas many countries that are still developing, uh, such as uh, Kenya or Oman, Yemen, uh, India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, etc., these countries aren't quite uh, living as lavish and less luxurious lifestyles as the United States, so they have lower footprint per person. Um, and if we look at that trend, we see that, you know, on average, uh, the, the more money you make, t it tends to be the higher your ecological footprint. Um, and the reason uh, for that are, are, there are multiple reasons for that, um, but what it means is that middle and low income countries, developing countries tend to have lower footprints. Uh, the reasons for that uh, have to do mostly with food and energy. Uh, more developed countries tend to have a more meat rich diet, which puts a, a larger strain on the environment, as we'll talk about later on. And their energy tends to be derived uh, more from uh, fossil fuels and pr therefore producing more CO2 emissions. Uh, and uh, these discrepancies between uh, developed versus uh, lesser developed countries can lead to something called the tragedy of the commons, which basically is this idea that um, if individuals, uh, or whether it's countries or individual people, use shared resources in their own self-interest, if they're greedy and they take more than they um, uh, are, are, are allotted, so to speak, um, then it will actually deplete the resources for the rest of the community. So in the United States, for example, uh, we're um, using about you know, 9.8 hectares when the, the average should be about uh, 1.8 per person. So we're, we're using more than our fair share of, of resources, uh, and that's going to basically not leave enough for everybody else. And that's this idea of the tragedy of the commons. Um, if, if everybody is, uh, that comes from this idea of a common grass space back in, I don't know, 1700s or something with your sheep, um, and if one or more farmers starts to increase the number of sheep they have, that's going to ruin the pasture for the rest of the farmers uh, and increase the number of environmental costs for, um, uh, uh, for everybody and ruin the pasture for everybody. So everybody loses if you start to take too much. Okay, and that's, that's pretty much all I got for you today. Uh, looking ahead, we're going to start thinking about how the United States uses their land um, and whether we're using it for cow and pasture range, for growing feed for the pastures, uh, whether it's for national parks, federal wilderness, state parks, etc. Uh, what are we using the land for in the United States? Uh, we'll start talking about that next class to try and break down a little bit about uh, how we use our resources um, and whether we're using them sustainably. So if you've got questions, uh, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.